One of the key things after you've looked at the adrenal stress, of course, is the adrenals are also responsible for aldosterone. And you'll find oftentimes patients who have been adrenally fatigued for a very long time get to the chronic fatigue syndrome. And there you find multiple steroid deficiencies, including the mineral corticoid aldosterone. Okay? Now, aldosterone, as you will see, it's a very important hormone. And I started looking at it because I suffer from aldosterone insufficiency. And uh, I am very much an adrenal junkie. I work excessively. Tanya and I both share notes about each other's adrenal uh, challenges. And often I find that, like recently when I had the flu, I was flat on my back because I was adrenally depleted, but I couldn't get up. I was very lethargic and my blood pressure went down 80 over 40 and the aldosterone level had just dissipated dramatically. So I embarked on looking on aldosterone quite some time ago, coincidentally, with um, the International Hormone Society. And uh, I did a lot of work with uh, Professor Thierry Hertog. Now, as we said, the adrenals, two little sacs that sit above the kidneys, they're responsible for cortisol, DHEA, aldosterone, and pregnenolone. And they are paired organs that cap the kidneys. Each gland consists of an outer cortex and an inner medulla. And this is where most of all these hormones are actually manufactured. So you find that in the three zones that we have in the adrenal cortex, we have the zona glomerulosa, where we make the mineral corticoids. Okay? So the mineral corticoids are made in this zone of the adrenal cortex, whereas the zona fasciculata is where we make the glucocorticoids, and the sex steroids are made in the zona reticularis. So here's an overall representation of how the adrenal uh, cortex steroid is, um, synthesizes these hormones. And you can see, effectively, one of the key reasons why I often like giving pregnenolone, especially if a patient's been adrenally depleted for a long period of time, DHEA alone won't cut it. Because you will see in a few minutes the pregnenolone steel pathway kicking in. So I like to give them a combination of pregnenolone with DHEA. And you can see from pregnenolone, you go to progesterone, progesterone, you go to aldosterone. Even giving these patients progesterone will help their aldosterone levels significantly. So keeping that in mind, these are the mineral corticoids. Here are the glucocorticoids, the cortisol, and here are your androgens. Okay? So as Tanya said, you've got your alarm phase, you've got your resistance phase, and you've got your exhaustion phase. And effectively, we start, as Tanya showed, with the alarm phase, the resistance or coping mechanisms with the stresses, and ultimately you end up with an exhaustion phase where we deplete the reserves. And this is why it's important not to give patients just DHEA and cortisol or aldosterone only. Okay? You really need to be working on the replenishment of these building blocks for long term. The same way as I said about the neurotransmitters, it is important to provide these building blocks to replenish. And as Tanya said, with the three stages, basically in stage one, you often find, let's say in the saliva results, you will find high DHEA and high cortisol. In stage two, where we have adrenal insufficiency in the resistance stage, phase, we have low DHEA and high cortisol, and the adrenal exhaustion, we have low DHEA and low cortisol. And you've seen that chart there that Tanya did, but the important thing why I'm so keen on incorporating cortisol with food sensitivities and allergies, as I said to you, is because the adrenals impact on the anti-inflammatory effects here, and when you look at the regulation of the immune system, it's quite significant. Have a look at the histamines that we talked about just briefly about the differences between food sensitivities versus allergies.
And Tanya, I recently found out why one of your patients has had those weird results that you repeat and they don't get the same result. Was it your patient or Dennis's? She's, the, we tested the blood, she's very high in salicylates. And the salicylates do interfere with a lot of the um, histamine release on some of these. So she definitely has histamine uh, um, salicylate issues and she needs to perhaps exclude some of the salicylates. Check whether she's got chemical sensitivities, like when she goes to perfume counters, does she have problems there? Yeah, because I was puzzled by that and I couldn't figure out and we did a, quite a few extensive tests on the re rest of her blood and we found fairly high levels. She had something like 20 times above normal range for salicylates. And you know, that does interfere with the, uh, it's an anti-inflammatory. It does interfere and it gives you those spurious results. This chart here, the reason I'm putting it here is to highlight a few things for you. Ratios, as you all know, I'm nicknamed as Mr. Ratio in endocrinology and in biochemistry. They give me a lot of information. Have, have a look at this. When we're looking at elevated cortisol to DHEA ratio, an abnormal ratio, excessive cortisol to a low DHEA, indicates that the patient's probably going through the pregnenolone steel pathway or the cortisol escape. Okay? And as we said, chronic stress will facilitate this. And you are stealing the pregnenolone to make progesterone, to make cortisol. And long term, that impacts on depletion of the availability to make aldosterone and the other sex steroids. Remember this chart here? What happens is you steal the pregnenolone, goes to progesterone and goes down to cortisol. So you get a cross here and you get a cross on the others here. So you get a depletion in these hormones, you get a depletion in the mineral corticoids, and you're just constantly overproducing cortisol. And you'll see this as a fairly interesting phenomenon. But look at this. With this elevated cortisol to DHEA ratio, you notice impact on the energy production, insulin sensitivity goes down, glucose utilisation goes down, blood glucose sugar goes up, gluconeogenesis goes up, osteoporosis, increases, fat accumulation increases, protein breakdown increases, salt and water retention increases, and even the immune activity is impacted on significantly. You get increase in circulating IgGs. So if you're going to be measuring food sensitivities and IgG molecules, you're going to find significantly elevated levels which don't necessarily correlate with the symptomatology of the patient. So this is the chronic stress which blocks DHEA, pregnenolone steel pathway. So we're stealing pregnenolone to make progesterone to make cortisol. And this is why I said in these cases, I prefer on these adrenally depleted patients to give them combination of pregnenolone with DHEA. And there's a lot of literature that indicates that you will get much better response. Now, remember we said that ultimately we can make aldosterone from from pregnenolone. So if you can't get aldosterone and you can get pregnenolone, upregulating the amount of pregnenolone you give the patient should hopefully upregulate that shunt and that pathway to help increase the aldosterone level as well. So as Tanya said, adrenal depletion is called adrenal fatigue and it doesn't necessarily have to be total depletion which is called Addison's disease. Most people go around in a state of significant um, uh, depletions, but not to the point where they are classified. I mean, you know, this is, uh, this is what I'm trying to, to get across in terms of interventional endocrinology. In conventional endocrinology, we say you have normal levels and you have catastrophically low levels and there's nothing in between. As a scientist, just ask yourself, can that possibly be the case?